This is a short introduction to wood framing intended for understanding how to go about designing wood frame systems for small, really micro building sizes. So we're going to look at a little bit about light wood framing as a general thing with the application to small buildings. I'm going to start with a little bit of a brief history of wood framing. Uh, and I mean, we could go on for a good couple hours on the history of wood framing, but we're going to spend only a few minutes. Then we'll look at how it actually is put together, the pieces, the jargon, looking at especially modern examples, and then some indications of how to draw certain types of designs. Wood is a fantastic material, and I mean that more than just for building structures. I mean, it's great for furniture, it's great for floor finishes, and so on. It's really quite widely available and usually uh, fairly affordable. Softwood lumber is what is used almost universally in wood framing in North America, and it is quite a bit less expensive as a material cost than alternatives. It's also quite easy to work, and that means that you can shape it, drill it, cut it, both in a factory setting and on the job site to accommodate job site needs. It has, from a technical structural perspective, an excellent strength to weight ratio. There's a reason that the early airplanes for almost 50 years were built out of wood because it had a great strength to weight ratio. And they switched to aluminum in the Second World War primarily because of issues of durability and moisture, not so much for better strength to weight ratio. It also has some really good thermal properties, something that's become clearer in the last 25 years as we focused more on sustainability energy efficiency and comfort. And relative to any other structural type material, wood really shines as a good thermally performing material. Of course, wood is renewable. Uh, they say it grows on trees. Uh, and it also sequesters carbon while it's doing that, taking carbon out of the atmosphere, converting it into the solid form that forms cellulose and lignin and hemicellulose within the wood. However, the downsides are that, well, uh, wood burns and wood rots. And despite those types of limitations, wood has become a very popular way of building buildings and has a track record that goes back millennia. So let's talk a little bit about the history of wood framing uh, in, in building construction. So wood buildings at the in early stages tended to use larger pieces of wood. And that's because they didn't have easy ways to cut and shape it. They didn't have easy ways to cut and shape most everything, but uh, wood was used in bigger chunks, uh, bigger beams, heavier elements, because it took a lot of work to be able to cut it into smaller pieces. Um, we would cut it into boards or square up beams with big saws in saw pits in the last 2000 or so years, uh, or square it with an adze. And eventually, as the Industrial Revolution hit the building industry in the early 1700s, we started to see water mill driven saws and then steam driven saws and then finally electric and diesel powered saws and the saws got better and also the energy to drive them got cheaper and so it became quite affordable to take big trees and cut them into smaller pieces of wood the sizes of wood that we currently see used in a lot of building systems. But back in 1250 or so, or earlier, the Roman times, building structures out of wood typically meant building structures out of rectangular, large chunks, basically squared up logs, uh, sometimes not even that squared up. So uh, this approach was used in 
many single family buildings, commercial buildings, etc. This is showing uh, some of the labels of how a heavier timber type of a home would have been built, say in the era of 16 or 1700 Britain. This is a slightly earlier example than that. This is, uh, as you can see, written on it. It says 1401. This is in Wales. Uh, I think they added the ATM money machine later than that. But the primary building was 1401. And when I took this picture, uh, this building was already over 600 years old. And you can see that big timbers, the, the voids filled in with clay, and straw and thinner hidden pieces of wood uh, between the heavy structural timbers. The structural timbers usually were dark colored in uh, black if they were to be t uh, painted with tar. Sometimes they were charred over a fire to make them black and give them some resistance to decay. And the infill made out of the clay and earthen products was routinely finished with lime cement, which is white. And that's how you get this black, white, Tudor style, half timber construction. Now, in North America, indigenous people in the eastern parts of and the west coast of Canada and, and America had uh, a lot of wood around and so naturally built their buildings out of wood. Uh, this is a close structure here from St. Marie among the Hurons. By close, I mean close to Cambridge, Ontario. Um, and it's in Midland and it would be uh, a longhouse. But the, the wood was more used almost in a, t a tension structure, compression structure kind of way not in the simpler uh, framed column and beam approach that modern North American framing is. So here we are going to now move into this modern approach. And this is what we expect you to be using in your projects in architectural engineering for the most part. Um, the light wood framing uh, can work very well and easily for small structures. This is something, one a small structure you can build. These, the one that's shown here, the photograph, is actually 64 square feet. It's exactly 8 feet by 8 feet in dimension to the outside face of the plywood. And there are studs spaced every 24 inches. Those studs were 2 by 4. Um, with plywood sheathing, the, the layer of solid material on the outside. And uh, this has uh, been around for more than 10 years, living through Ontario winters, etc. You can see some details here in the drawing, and you can study that under your own time, but those are uh, labeling some of the materials like sheathing, rafters, studs, and so forth. It's quite helpful to get to know these words because they are used not just in wood framing, but also in light gauge steel framing. And so we see the language of wood framing being applied quite uh, widely in uh, co-op work terms you're going to discover in all kinds of different modes of the construction industry. You're going to see these language, this language used. Um, so, you know, you take a look here, the most important ones would be things like the stud, the sill, the top plate, the bottom plate. Those are, you know, the most fundamental. And this shows a lintel that, or a header that's being used to span over top of a window. You see that there's a multiple uh, series of uh, on-edge pieces of wood to do that. Um, and if we look here at a built example. Uh, this is a corner and you can see the roof rafters coming down, landing on double top plates which are supported by fairly closely spaced studs. You'll see they have a lintel over the window. Um, all of those features. The one thing that you see here is the diagonal piece of wood. That's just a temporary construction diagonal that's used to square everything up before they nailed it firmly into place. 
So this drawing here also from one of the learn references, the fine home building framing guide um, shows a number of the, the terms that are used. Again, very helpful for you to learn this. We've also noted that um, although this is not just a wood framing thing, being able to describe properly the words that uh, are associated with different kinds of roofing uh, or roof forms, I wouldn't call it roofing, roof forms. The hip roof was what you see in the upper left. That's the most common. Um, and then the pitch roof or the duo pitch or the duo slope with the rib ridge in the middle, again, a classic kind of a roof. And then on the right-hand side, we see a monoslope, a single pitch roof, kind of more edgy and modernist, although from a technical perspective, the mono pitch roof is more appropriate for short spans. The duo pitch roof tends to be more appropriate for longer, over six meter type spans, over five meter spans. And then if you look at the bottom right, we see the flat or quote low slope roof. Low slope is the technically correct definition because there should always be a little bit of slope to drain water, to drains or over the edge. So those are very four most common types of roofing shapes or forms that you should know the language for. Now, when it comes to drawing our wood frame buildings, one of the most important things to understand is that when you cut through a solid chunk of wood, sawn timber, two by six, two by four, any of those words being used, um, we tend to put an X through it to denote the fact that it is solid inside. It would be disastrous to draw that darkly shaded or something it would be way too strong graphically and so they just put an x through it now not all pieces of wood continue for a long distance past the section cut like a plate or a stud wood and sometimes we use short chunks of wood called blocking i'll show you a picture in a moment and it is occasionally used that if it is a blocking that you're cutting through, you only put one line. You don't do the X, you just do the one line. So let me show you what blocking looks like. Um, and this is a taller than eight foot, taller than 2.44 meter stud wall. It's going to be uh, some sort of a, resident, a residential a veterans hospital type of a building. And uh, but the floor to ceiling height on this first floor is something like 10 feet or three meters. And so uh, they've actually added some blocking uh, along the top of where the windows are. And that blocking is probably being installed so that gypsum wallboard, which comes in eight foot long sheets in many cases, can be attached. But also sometimes blocking is is provided for structural purposes or for attachment of finishes purposes, like a place to attach your kitchen cabinets to or something like that. So blocking is just a non-primary structural element um, that we often put in our wall framing, floor framing, roof framing. So let's just look at a few more terms. Um, these ones applied to roofs. You again need to get comfortable with the idea of the parts of a roof. What's the difference between an eave uh, and a fascia? Or what is a soffit? I think most of you know what a ridge is and a valley is, but do you know what a rake is? So those terms are things that you should get to know and uh, if you don't know them, uh, here they are put down on one slide that you can study. There are two fundamentally different approaches to how you put together light wood framing. That is balloon framing and platform framing. Balloon framing is the early form where the wood stud transfers from the foundation all the way up to the roof. Platform framing, by contrast, the wood stud always goes from the top side of one floor to the underside of the next floor. 
So in the early days, when buildings were routinely one and a half to two and a half stories tall, and large trees were available, it was common to use balloon framing, where the wood stud in the wall would go from the foundation all the way up to the roof. This actually created a fair number of problems because it was more difficult to assemble, requiring some bracing at mid heights, for example. And a really the Achilles heel of this approach was that it also allowed fire to distribute through the empty stud bypassing floors. Whereas platform framing, it actually had built in fire blocking in the form of the top and bottom plates so that fire wouldn't easily transfer from one floor to the other. The development of requirements for labor safety in terms of assembling, erecting a building, also the shortage of 20 foot long two by fours um, resulted in platform framing increasingly being desirable and the disadvantage of fire spread was enough that by the Second World War, for sure, most buildings were being built by as platform framing, and that today is the most common. We still use wood balloon framing when we're doing story and a half. What I mean by that is you might have only, a, say, a, a 3.6 meter tall wall, and the, each floor is 2.4 meters. So that means the first floor is full height and the second floor, the wall only goes up 1.8 meters. And then the roof begins sloping in from that. So this has a real practical use today in tall open uh, rooms within a otherwise one story house and also in allowing for one and a half, two and a half type story configurations. Now, when it comes to drawing these things and understanding how they work, I'm going to show you a couple of three-dimensional isometrics and then some two-dimensional drawings. This here is an example of a rake uh, connecting up to the wall. And there's a couple of approaches to how to make the rake. One approach would be to notch out of the studs a receiving slot to, to hold the rafter, which is the sloped roof beam. That requires a little bit more uh, skill in carpentry and hence labor cost, but it's also provides a stronger, if you need it, to support a longer span roof. In the smaller projects where your roof spans are only, you know, four or five meters, um, the approach on the right is, is totally adequate because there's more than enough strength to, to hold the roof at the rake with just a flat sort of stud along the top. So here's a, that's just a couple of examples. Now, if I were drawing in uh, two dimensions, as you would likely do if you're doing a sectional detail for a construction set, uh, you would see a double top plate, the two X's showing that those are continuous members that are continuing through past the section and we will cut a notch out of the roof rafter and that notch is called a bird's mouth and is actually the most important dimension and component to get right in the in the construction of a of, of this type of a detail you'll see on the right hand side we have not just a floor to wall but we have sorry a roof to wall we have a floor to roof and wall. And this is going to be quite common uh, in attic spaces that are occupied, etc. So that's what, why that's showing the ceiling joist, the roof rafter and the wood stud and how they would come together. Now, when it comes to completing the roof, you need to think about how to make it water resistant, how to stop air from leaking through, how to stop heat from leaking through. And to do that, we uh, will use a number of features, but how we approach it in practice depends a fair bit on the kind of ceiling on the inside that you're looking for. If you just want a, what's called a cathedral ceiling, 
where the wall meets a sloping roof and the roof rises up. Um, a detail is provided on the left showing one example. Notice the examples I'm showing are modern in that they have a layer of exterior insulation. So yes, there's insulation between the studs, but to uh, improve the thermal resistance further and to blunt any short circuits that the wood framing may cause, a blanket of insulation is put over not just the walls, but also the roof. This is something that you might have a hard time finding if you're looking, if you're using Pinterest or something like that, uh, because those are often 15 year old sort of ideas or older and finding details with exterior insulation can often be a little bit harder, but that is absolutely the normal standard of construction today. Now, you'll also notice on these drawings that the air barrier, which is uh, more important than insulation, uh, is also called out. Not vapor barrier, but air barrier. And also, you'll see that we're not relying on the roofing material to stop all the rainwater, but rather a roof underlayment or building paper or something like that without a label like that, which is a water layer underneath the roofing so that the roofing material doesn't have to be perfect. If you want a standard roof with a meaning standard being the most common in housing with a ventilated attic of relatively large size, the upper right detail provides you some idea on how to have a ventilated roof with a rafter that overhangs the wall and all that kind of stuff. And the bottom right shows the third of the most common details where the roof is actually exposing the wood to the inside. And it does that by putting thicker layers of insulation on the outside of the wood framing. And this is sort of like the ski lodge or cabin feel. And that's this is a, a building science detail for how you'd put the layers together properly. There are other details that you need to consider and that is how you want to finish the look of the of the building. It's surprisingly significant how a passerby would experience the building with relatively modest changes in how you treat the roof to wall connection. In the simplest of buildings, the wood rafters are exposed both on their ends and on their underside. And under the most complete and polished buildings, you can't see the rafters at all. There would be a fascia, uh, the vertical element with some trim. Then there's an underside soffit also with some trim that can really change how that important part of a building, especially a one-story building, is experienced by the people who are walking up to it. It doesn't seem like it at first, but when you start drawing out those details, you'll see that it really does affect how the building looks and feels. Now we also, going from the roofs, let's talk about the floors. Um, the floors are a lot like uh, walls, really, uh, a lot of the same framing. Uh, but of course, as you span larger distances, uh, the two by four, which might be fine for a wall, now you have to have a two by six or a two by eight to be able to span sufficient distances for the floor. In almost all cases, we're going to put some sort of a sheet product, panel sheathing product in a sheet form, um, like OSB or plywood, to make the floor relatively flat and smooth and be ready to uh, accept some finishes. Now, when we're drawing, say, a, a first floor um, floor connecting to a, two, a wall of a two-story building, um, if we're looking at platform frame construction, here is a couple of details. <clears throat> the detail where the floor beams are running into the wall and also the detail where the floor beams are parallel to the wall. Both of those are conditions that you need to think through when you're drawing up your framing, when you're conceiving of how you're gonna frame this building. Now, 
if you want to do balloon framing or need to do balloon framing because you're looking for a story and a half kind of a construction, well, then those same details have to be drawn, uh, although there's slight variations, which I'm hoping these drawings will be clear enough that you'll understand what's being done. It's often helpful to do a five minute sketch in three dimensions, an isometric, if you will, of a corner of your project to understand how the different elements are going to be running in the floor, uh, in the wall, and eventually even adding on the roof. But try and sketch it out. Make sure you can visualize in your mind how the elements are going in two different directions in your as it applies to your project that you're working on. So we also have to think about interior walls. Sometimes the interior wall is just a partition, uh, and that means a separating space, uh, which means it could be quite thin. Uh, we typically use two by fours in single family residential housing because space is not that valuable. But if you're trying to save every inch as they are in tiny houses and in RVs and such, um, it's not uncommon to have non-load-bearing partition walls made out of uh, two by threes uh, or even two by twos, so that or two by fours laid flat, same dimension, and then sheet on both sides. <clears throat> now the foundation is another special condition that needs to be considered for pretty much every building. In small wood frame buildings especially ones that are maybe not as permanent, will often use point foundations, a minimum of three, I think for obvious reasons, but often four is considered a practical minimum. And sometimes we go to six or eight, depending on the size and scale and how much you want your beams to span. And those are just points on a grid system in the earth. Those points are uh, hold up beams that span at least between the points, but often cantilever over either end of those point foundations. And then a wood frame system, like I showed in the previous slide, is then added on top of that. So that's a common condition, very practical, easy to do solution. You see it here. You do remember that if we're making it out of wood, we have to worry about rot. So one of the answers is to don't let the wood get very wet, which means keep it up away from melting snow and rain splashes. And another thing you can do is put enough poison in the wood, it's called pressure treating, um, that bugs and rot won't eat it. Now, even when you go to the extent of using pressure treated, uh, you want to keep the wood ideally a little bit out of the ground, but you don't need to. As you must know, one of the acceptable foundations for a small building is literally a pressure treated post of four by four or six by six dimension, simply placed in a hole 1.2 meters deep. And pressure treating is good enough that those posts do tend to last well over 30 years and uh, you know, pr probably 70 years. So that's a, a, a reasonable option in some situations. Now, a more modern type of a foundation, seeing quite a bit of use these days, are helical piles. I'm showing two versions on the left side, which are basically point foundations that are screwed into the ground. Sometimes they call them soil screws. And these can be done relatively easily and they're quite durable by providing corrosion resistance and quite flexible in design. So it's quite easy <clears throat> to put them where you want them to be. It works for some pretty bad soil conditions, gets below frost line, lots of advantages there. On the right hand side, we see the, the simplest of foundation <clears throat> and the one used for the least permanent buildings. And that is simply blocks, usually made out of concrete, um, to keep the wood framing up away from the earth so that it stays dry. 
And the disadvantage of this approach is that frost movement will still make the building move. And for a lot of small buildings, the, we're, we're willing to live with that, especially if they don't have drywall that can be cracked or you don't expect the soil to move too much because it's not a highly frost susceptible soil. You can do that for small buildings and many, many small buildings and outdoor decks are supported in exactly this way. So speaking of decks, um, there are a lot of similarities of the wood framing of floors that apply to decks outdoors. But outdoor decks are almost always made of decay resistant wood or pressure treated wood. Now that doesn't mean you, you soak them in water, but it does mean that by leaving cracks between the boards so that water runs through and air can move through and dry uh, and using pressure treated joists and beams, you can make pretty durable outdoor wood structures that expand the living space and certainly are enjoyed and experienced by many people. Just a brief word here on how these are built. Um, in a platform frame, you basically build the wall on the platform provided by the floor below. So <clears throat> this is an example of a project being built in Kitchener, Ontario. The first floor walls and this, the floor uh, that's going to be the, the floor that people walk on in the bedrooms has been built. And now you're looking at the wall framing being assembled by carpenters and laid out in this correct way. And then when they're done, they will tilt it up. They will get a number of people and they will lift the whole wall up <clears throat> and then plumb it, meaning make it vertical, and then it, uh, fix it into place temporarily with those diagonal braces you see in the bottom right. Um, when you've gone all the way around the building and you've got four walls on and they're all braced, now you can reach up and install the first of the rafters that are, or the ceiling joists that are going to go above this. And so eventually you build enough wood framing that you can put the OSB sheathing on it and you can walk on it, attach that. Now the floors are prevented from falling over by being attached by this floor. And now you can just go and build another wall and tilt it up and repeat the process. Now, this means you could just keep doing this for 100 stories <clears throat> if it could structurally do it. Uh, really, structurally, we tend to um, have most experience going up to about three stories using standard rules. Beyond three stories, it does require more framing, not just bigger two by sixes, but more closely spaced. And eventually, once you get up to five or six stories of a typical kind of a building, that lowest floor is almost solid wood. And this leads to mass timber construction, nail laminated timber, cross laminated timber, making sense because once you've got, you got to support five stories above you, you probably will end up making it out of solid wood because it's just easier. Here you see the project I'd shown you before. Walls are tilted up, supported with braces. The next wall has been framed, is lying there <clears throat> in, in the foreground. Now, how do you go about drawing these things? Well, in a lot of construction, they don't provide a great amount of detail of framing because if it is for standard housing construction, it is presumed that tradespeople, carpenters, will know what they're doing. They will just, because it's so common and they use standardized components, it's really the, the drawings may only say two by <clears throat> four at 16 inch or two by six at 24 inch or something like that and no more. But uh, it is increasingly seen as better practice for you to take a floor plan as shown here in the Building Science Corporation drawings you can find on Learn and is to lay them out. And that allows people 
to see the actual framing intended, but it also helps the designer understand how much wood is going in, how they need to provide space for the uh, rafters, the sorry, the dormers, the windows, the doors, etc. So I really think you do look at those drawing sets at the Building Science Corporation that we had uh, on Learn. So there's a number of supporting documents on Learn that you can, uh, I guess, support uh, answering questions, learn more, solidify your learning. Um, and we also have the whole Canadian Home Builders Association wood frame or wood housing guide, you know, hundreds of pages. I, I consider that more of a, a reference. You look up specific things, but feel free to take that with you uh, on a work term. You may want to have it available to you. So there's a, also the drawings I mentioned from Building Science Corporation showing best practice. Uh, <clears throat> definitely all sources of inspiration for you. So um, the end result for a wood frame house is actually kind of complicated looking, but that's why it's important to break it down into simple components of wall, roof, floor. How do these connect together? And then use those tools, that knowledge to uh, make your project work.